Well, that was an announcement that I missed. Uh, if you see the calendar, we're having uh, Martin and Joy Cook here on the 20th of August. After service, we'll do a picnic with burgers and dogs, and we'll have a sign-up sheet at some point. So um, today we continue looking at God's grace. Uh, last week we saw how Paul, 14 years earlier, had been given a great present by God. Anyone remember what it was? Ah, that was that was afterwards. What was the first present that God gave him? Where was he taken? He was taken up to heaven. And he got to hear things. I always thought it was funny. He got to hear things that people weren't supposed to hear down here. But he never talks about seeing things. John later on would see things. Uh, and he was told to tell people. Um, so, and to prevent Paul from being too proud, because this is a great honor... God also gave him another present, which is what Kathy said, a thorn in the flesh. Uh, and the word tra Greek word translated thorn actually means a stake. So, and not a, a nice ribeye. It means a stake. Uh, and if you thought a thorn was painful, imagine a stake. Last week I asked you how painful was a th uh, thorn, and everyone here is like, no one said, oh, I like thorns. No, it, it, they hurt. Uh, now imagine a stake. And this thorn was described as a messenger of Satan. We don't know what it was. It could have been a physical issue, a mental issue, a spiritual issue. Whatever it was, keep in mind that thorn analogy. Anyone here, when I ask, if you press on a thorn in your skin, does it hurt worse or less? No one said less. You know, so... We're, we may be bumpkins, but we're not stupid. So something I didn't point out last week, who told Paul? Who was talking to Paul? It was not God, who some may think is detached from the human condition. No, but if you have a red-letter Bible, you'll notice that Paul's conversation in, in 1 Corinthians, well, let's go to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, it's verse 12, or chapter 12, it's red-lettered, and that means it was the word of Jesus. Um, so the person Paul prayed to was Jesus, and it was Jesus who told Paul no. Jesus, who could have rel couldn't relate to our human suffering. Remember, he came here. Paul would write near the end of his current letter in 2 Corinthians 13, 4, he said, although he was crucified in weakness... He now lives by the power of God. We, too, are weak, just as Christ was. He's talking about the human condition. But when we deal with you, we will be alive with him and will have God's power. Remember, Jesus was not some... You always see pictures of Jesus. He has the long, flowing hair. Looks Everything looks pristine. His hair is not disheveled. Um, he looked perfect. And like some, you'd want to follow him. But in Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3, we read this. He says, my servant, who Isaiah is talking about Jesus, uh, grew up in the Lord's presence for, like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. That's how God spoke of what Jesus would look like when he got here. Yet Jesus was God in human form. But when he was here, he set aside his divine nature. In Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8, and our rule here is if it's three verses or more, we'll switch, jump to it. So hold on to 2 Corinthians and flip over to Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. He says, You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think equality was God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave 
and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus did so so he could relate to the human condition. So no one could ever come and accuse God and say, you don't know what it's like to be a human. In Hebrews 4, verses 14 and 15, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. No one can say God cannot understand what we go through here. It says that Jesus was tempted in every single way that you and I are. Um, and yet he did it without sin. Jesus was just like us in a lot of respects. He got tired. He got hungry. He suffered the loss of loved ones. He hated the idea of death. Last week we saw that even though Paul prayed three times to Jesus to remove that thorn in the flesh, that stake in the flesh, and we saw how when Paul prayed, he didn't just pray like, oh dear God, could you fix this for me or take this away from me? No, it says in literally he begged Jesus three times that the thorn be removed. When was the last time any of us begged God for something? And remember, he recognized who gave him that thorn. God gave it to him. And yet he's saying, take it away. Some may ask, how could a good God do such a thing? Well, Jesus answered that very question. You see, each time Jesus said no, he also assured Paul something. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus' grace is sufficient, and it comes in an inexhaustible supply. Grace that no one deserves and no one can earn. So wherever Paul went, both the thorn in the flesh and God's grace were with Paul throughout his ministry. Remember, 14 years prior to when Paul wrote this, so this was at the very beginning, before he even had a ministry, this happened to Paul. So the thorn and God's grace were with him when he planted churches, when he was debating people in the synagogues, when he was being whipped or beaten with rods. They were there with he and Silas as they were in the bottom of the Philippian jail. They were singing songs and praising God and praying all the while with the thorn and God's grace. You see, Paul, as he traveled, he not only carried the thorn, but the strength of God's grace. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, he, had, in his earlier letter, wrote this. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And you thought Popeye said that. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. He's talking about other apostles. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Notice the thorn hurt. It hurt him all the time. But the grace of God is what empowered him. It made him realize on his own he could do nothing. Remember earlier in the uh, book of uh, Second Corinthians, he listed all of his uh, positives. You know, all the things. He was a Benjamite. He was, had, he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees, he said. As to righteousness, he was righteous. But that thorn pulled him up short. That weakness was forced upon him, made it all the more easy to depend on God's strength rather than his own. He didn't depend on his knowledge as much as he depended on God's grace. A question that bears repeating, what is grace? Grace is God's undeserved favor. No one deserves salvation. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so that none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. 
He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Because of God's grace, we are saved through our faith in Jesus Christ. As I said, no one deserves God's grace. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you might be a little bit better than the person next to you because that's what we always compare ourselves to. But as I've said before, it's like standing on the shoreline in the Atlantic Ocean and you could be the world long jumper and you all jump to jump to Europe, you're all going to get wet and not even come close. We all fall short. And no one even gets close. And just to clear up something else, grace is different from mercy. Grace is getting something we do not deserve, like eternal life. Mercy is not getting something that we do deserve, like punishment for our sins in Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5 but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead it is only by God's grace that you have been saved because of God's mercy we are not all going straight to hell Remember how powerful that image is. The dead cannot do things on their own. The Bible says that while we were still dead in our sins, Christ came to save us. And when he rose, the same spirit has been given to us. Salvation is not about the things we do. It's not about knowing the right words. It's not about attending church. It's not about singing and leading ministries. It's about grace. But that's not all Paul's, uh, Jesus said to Paul. Jesus said that his power works best in weakness. The Greek word there for weakness is dunamis, and it means God's infinite power. That's where we get our word dynamite from. And the word translated for weakness means our sickness, our infirmity, which again points back to the thorn. Maybe it was a physical disability. You know, remember he said he didn't always speak so well, you know, Jesus' power works best when we look at all of our abilities as infirmities. Anyone ever do that? Anyone look at us and say, oh, this, this positive thing about me, I'm a good public speaker, you know, it's a negative, you know, because then I don't depend on God. I, I heard someone once say to me, because they didn't want to do a ministry, they said, I'm not going to do a ministry, give it to someone that's gifted in it. See, I think the real thing here is, God wants people who are willing to step out in faith and not people who are gifted. If you're a gifted public speaker, great. Maybe you should do something behind the scenes. Oh, but I want to be up in front. No, no, maybe you should trust God because that way you know that it's working through God. It's why I say a small church, we can do as much as a mega church. I'm not being proud. As long as we remain in the will of God and depend on his strength, we can do all things. I believe it says that in the Bible. One other thing I wanted to point out is that God's grace is not equivalent to God's power. Let me say that again. God's grace is not the same thing as God's power. You see, while they're closely connected, they're not the same. Remember, Jesus' response to Paul's request to remove the thorn that was given to him was, he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Jesus said his grace was sufficient for Paul and that it was his power is made perfect and works best in weakness or in disease. And Paul basically says, fantastic. I'm going to boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. When was the last time you boasted to someone about your weaknesses? Is that something we do today? You know, you can tell I'm not a very good public speaker. I don't like speaking in front of people. Uh, but God called me here. That's why I'm here. It's when... Christians recognize that they are weak and powerless, unable to do anything of value to the kingdom of God, then they let Jesus' power work through them. 
Philippians 4.13, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. God's strength is not from being gifted. It's from Christ himself, from actively being in Christ, having that close relationship with Jesus, being in contact with him through prayer. Remember Katie's favorite verse, 2 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice always. I know I got the order mixed up. Being in contact with Jesus through prayer all the time, not just when we need him. Demonstrating our love for him by obeying his commands, no matter how hard they may appear. Today we're going to see this correlation between grace and power. This is actually something I talked about in one form or another a lot this year, and it took me a while to realize that. You know, Romans 8, 28, I bet you most of us can recite it, right? But we have different versions. So uh, in the NLT it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Notice he didn't say everything that happened to God's children was good after all we know a lot of us go through things that are not good not good at all horrible or terrible a lot of bad things happen to God's children bad things that seem to come out of nowhere and blindside us but Paul says that God causes everything to work together for good but only to those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them which means that if one does not really love God, this promise is not for them. So how do we know if, if we or someone really loves God? I guess that's a logical question. It comes down to obedience. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, obey my commandments. And later on in, in verses 21 and 23, he repeats himself multiple times that The way you demonstrate love for Jesus is to obey his commandments. So it's simple if a person really loves God because do they obey? And remember, there's only two commandments. Jesus boiled everything down to he made it easy peasy, at least in words, right? Let's flip over to Matthew 22. If you're in Philippians, it's off to the left. Matthew 22. If you only have a New Testament, it's the first book. But the question is, what is it? If what number book is it? If you're in the combined, so Matthew 22, starting in verse 37, he says he was asked, "What are the two greatest commands?" And here's what Jesus said. He says, "You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind." This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Notice we don't love God or his son by simply saying it. It must come from the heart. Not out of obligation. Not because you want to check a box and say, well, see, I I said the words. But with a heartfelt desire. People put their obedience into practice. Jesus said in Matthew 7, well, if you're Matthew anyway, let's flip over to Matthew 7. That's a number of words to the left, or pages to the left. Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, was saying, everyone who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built a house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was, has been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. The only difference between a successful house that can stand up to the storms of the time and a non-successful house, remember, before the storms came, they looked exactly the same. 
The difference was one per applied what he knew and the other one just knew. You have to be obedient and put into practice what you know. When you're firmly in the center of God's purpose, you can rest assured that all things that you are going through are going to have fruition in something that is ultimately good, regardless of how bad it feels right now. And a believer accepts this. No, they don't just accept it. They live it out loud for everyone to see. Again, it comes from the heart of the person. You can't just say, I have to do this. And as I was thinking of an example in the Bible, because, you know, the Bible has great uh, uh, examples of this. God brought to mind a man and one of his sons who dealt with bad things in very different ways. I have to admit, a strange reason, I never really put these two attitudes together until I was praying the sermon. The man was Jacob. He was reaping the harvest of the seeds he planted all during his younger years. At this point in his life, J Joseph was gone. He believed he was dead. Reuben had been disgraced. Judah was dishonored. Simeon and Levi had broken his heart. Dinah had been defiled. Simeon was even now in an Egyptian pr uh, prison. His wife, Rachel, was dead. Famine threatened their family. And on top of all this, there came a demand from Egypt that young Benjamin must appear before Egypt's great governor before any more food supplies were going to be released to them. Do you remember what his reaction was when he heard all of this? Now, Simeon was an old man at this point. Well, I mean, Jacob was an old man at this point. He had wrestled with God at one point in his life. He had been the one that God said, I'm, through your line, I'm going to... Uh, the Messiah will come. But in Genesis 42, verse 36, Jacob exclaimed, you are robbing me of my children. Joseph is gone, Simeon is gone, and now you want to take Benjamin too. Everything is going against me. He was the third of the patriarchs. Remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He's not looking so good now. He seems lost. Speaking and living like he trusted at one point, he wasn't trusting in God's plan. He was seeing the hand of God when it was looked good, but now he was looking at it saying, this is against me. He saw nothing but the trial that his family was going through. His focus was on how bad it was. But see, unknown to him, God had been using some of those very things, the loss of his son Joseph, for an ultimate good to fulfill the promise God made to him. Remember, backing up, this is one of the problems that Joseph, Jacob had. He played the favorite game. And whenever you play the favorite game with your children, someone's going to get hurt. Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors, which by tradition should have gone to Reuben, the oldest. His brothers literally hated him. And not just because Joseph was their father's favorite, Joseph, let's just say, Joseph was, was not a nice little kid. Remember he had dreams of the kids, uh, his brothers worshiping him? And he went and, you know, he didn't do a diplomatic thing, just kept his mouth shut. He went and told him, hey, I had a dream. You guys were all bowing down to me. He told his father that. Um, but regardless, of, he needed to learn some humility. He needed to learn things. And when you know it, that was part of God's plan. His brothers got to a point where they've had enough. Anyone here with siblings that got under your skin? I mean, I'm sure that never really happened. You know, uh, I, I had a brother and a sister, an older sister, younger brother, and then my mom brought in like 150 uh, foster kids because she loved kids. Um, there was always someone you were fighting against. Was anyone ever get to the extreme that you'd sell your, child, your brother or sister off into slavery? I think that's a line that most of us hopefully wouldn't cross. But they did. They sold him into slavery. But we never see Joseph despair. We never see him pout. Never see him even pray and cry out to God. When he got sold by, he got uh, hired by, or he got bought by Potiphar, 
Uh, his master trusted him, put him in charge of his household. His master's wife was attracted to Joseph and tried to seduce him. And when she couldn't handle a slave's rejection, she accused, accused him of rape. Master sent him to prison. In prison, the jailer recognized there was something special about Joseph as well. And Joseph, by the power of God, correctly interpreted two other uh, prisoners' dreams. He said, one of you is going to lose your head in this matter, and the other one is going to be restored to his uh, other position. And he goes, when you get up there, remember me. That's all he said. That's all the guy had to do is, hey, there's a guy who, in prison. He doesn't belong there. Well, the guy forgot him for two years. Talk about a raw deal. But again, we don't see Joseph lamenting his life. Now, some may say, well, maybe no one recorded him grumbling and complaining. Well, who wrote the book Bible? God. Yeah, human hands may have done it, but God's spirit inspired it. And when you read the Bible and you see all the negative things that God says about his, some of his great leaders, I think this would be something that he would include. So, no, there's no record of Joseph complaining because it was not his way. Long story short, after two more years in prison, the Pharaoh had a dream. No one could interpret, and suddenly that man remembered, hey, you know, I know a guy. You know, it's always good to meet someone that knows a guy. Um, Joseph correctly interpreted the dream. Actually, correction, in Genesis 41, 16, Joseph said, it is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Joseph had matured. The dreams were warnings from God of coming seven years of incredible plenty, followed by seven years of incredible famine. Pharaoh made Joseph the second only to him in power. And for seven years, Joseph stockpiled the, the warehouses with abundance of food. And so when the famine years came, it was a worldwide famine. And Jacob was, or Joseph was shrewd because every time it got worse, he, people were willing to give up their land, their riches, until by the end, literally the Pharaoh owned everything in Egypt. And because it's a worldwide famine, jo Jacob's family in the promised land were not immune to the famine's effects. And his brothers went to see, unknowingly went to see their brother that they sold into slavery. A brother who recognized them, but they didn't recognize. Needless to say, Joseph forgave them. He gave them great lands in Goshen to raise their herds. Jacob came down and met the Pharaoh, and then Jacob died. Joseph's brothers thought that now Joseph was going to have his revenge. They thought, well, revenge is a dish best served cold. Uh, remember how long the brothers must have been carrying this fear. How long they were afraid that when dad died, Joseph would take revenge because that's what we would do. That burden that they carried day in and day out, looking for when their father would be no more and Joseph would seek his revenge. Not against themselves, because now they had families, which hurts even worse. What a price to pay for selling their brother. But do you remember Joseph's reaction? It was almost sad. It was sad. He was no longer that boy that went into slavery. In, in Genesis 50, verse 20, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. You think you sold me into slavery? No, God did. Joseph shares the faith in God's plans, plans that Joseph was a part of, even though he didn't see the big picture. Remember, God's plan was not just to save Joseph. Does anyone here remember who of uh, jo Jacob's line Jesus came from? Which of the, of the 12 sons? Judah. 
Judah. He wasn't even saving Joseph's family for this. So you see, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And in order to love God, it must be more than lip service. Loving God means obeying him from the heart with the heart attitude. And because of that love, we can, like Joseph, have faith to believe that all the things that are occurring to us, no matter how horrible, are happening as part of God's plan. A plan that he doesn't have to show us. I mean, let's face it. If God showed you step by step everything that you were going to go through when you were young, would you even take a step in the Christian faith? No. We, it says, uh, your word is a light unto my path. As I said before, that light was a special light that would show you one step. That's all we see. We see the next step, and we take it in faith. And then we see the next step. We take that in faith. When you're going through dark days, days where it seems like one bad thing happens after another, uh, one of my favorite movies is The Replacements. Um, and they were talking about what do you fear? And, you know, they do the funny things, spiders and all these big football players. Are, oh, yeah, I hate spiders. How about snakes? Oh, I hate snakes. And finally he points to the quarterback and says, what do you fear? And he goes, quicksand. And, he's, and they all, oh, yeah, quicksand's bad. And they thought it was just like any other fear. And the coach knew that there was something more. He says, what do you mean? He said, well, you're out on the field. You're playing great football. And all of a sudden you make one mistake. And then you make another and another and another. Someone else makes a mistake. And you're drowning then in quicksand. And sometimes bad things happen that way. But if you truly love God, take solace in the fact you're not going through this alone. You're walking with God. Remember Jesus' last words to us was he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We're walk He's walking with us through it. The battle's already been won. You have been saved by grace through faith. Grace is, remember, not getting something or getting something you don't deserve. So if you have faith to believe that God saved you by his grace, then you have access to his power. A power that is made perfect in our weakness. So that we can too, like Paul say, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. His grace, his power. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you, Lord, for, for the thorns that you brought into our lives. For, for you being there, Lord, when we're going through times where it feels like we're in quicksand, Lord, that we just can't get our feet underneath us. Father, we, we, we praise you for that. Lord, help us to recognize that it's not about us. Because if it is, we'll fail every time. But that's about you. Guide our steps, Lord, as we go about our days, Lord. In your name.